Some of those who were planning on being a part of our worship service this morning are sick, and so we want to lift up them in prayer, but uh, it's good to see you in God's house. A couple of things that I would like to mention to you while you are turning to Luke chapter 11 in your copy of God's Word, and that is the first one, pray for the choir next uh, Sunday morning. They're going to be sharing uh, some uh, Christmas music with us, and uh, so encourage them, pray for them. And uh, this is difficult times for music, because if you have different ones that are sick, then they are not here. And so uh, we want to be sure and pray for them. That would be a great time of worship in music next Sunday morning. Invite some folks to come with you if you possibly can. The second thing is, you notice that there was a video at the beginning of our uh, worship time, and that was in regards to the International Mission Board. <clears throat> now, we have a lot of folks from different uh, churches sometimes on a Sunday morning, and sometimes whenever you hear International Mission Board or the name Lottie Moon, you may not know what that is about. I'd like to mention to you, Lottie Moon was a Southern Baptist missionary many years ago to the country of China, and we have named our International Mission Board work with her name, and we have an offering each Christmas time, usually throughout the entire month of December, that we collect offerings. All of these monies, 100% of them, go to foreign mission work of some kind, and so all the monies that are taken up do that. There's no monies taken out of that for administrations or anything like that whatsoever. Our goal here at First Southern is uh, $8,000, and so if you'd like to contribute to that, you'll need to mark it some way on an offering envelope that it goes to Lottie Moon or the International Mission Board offering. Turn with me to Luke and the 11th chapter. Luke and the 11th chapter. <clears throat> I don't uh, think ahead many times uh, about the sermons I preach or gear it towards children when we have children in our worship service. But uh, I thought it appropriate uh, as I was thinking about kind of giving you an idea this morning in regards to doing jobs halfway and not realizing the importance of doing a job fully. When I was a young person, uh, my mother would come into the room on Saturday morning. Now, this was the Saturday morning routine. It was a job. It was something that I knew I was responsible for. But my mother would often have to remind me it's Saturday morning. It's time to clean your room. It means pick up all the stuff off the floor. Secondly, I had to vacuum the carpet with an uh, old-timey vacuum, you know. And then thirdly, uh, if uh, she had washed the sheets, I needed to put the sheets on and make the bed. Now, that was my Saturday morning routine. Now, that was her routine for me. I should state it that way. My Saturday morning routine was to turn on the TV and watch cartoons. Now, that's all I had a, a desire to do at that particular time in my life. And so I was watching the cartoons. My mother would come in and say, you know, vacuum the car, pick up all your toys, and make your bed. And I would just continue staring at the television. And eventually, she would walk out and walk back in and say, <clears throat> and then she would actually have to stand. You know, parents, you do this, right? You stand between the TV or whatever activity they're doing and your child and say, I told you to do something. And brilliant-minded pastors, even young, look at their parents and say, oh, you mean right now. <laughs> and uh, so I'd get up. <clears throat> Wait for her to leave the room and uh, shove all the toys under the bed, throw the cover on top of the bed, pick up a few things of lint, and think my job was done. Now, I don't know anybody else that does that, but I uh, fall into that particular category. Now, one of the things that we recognize is there's such an easy thing to do is do a job halfway. And one of the things that has infiltrated into human life is that many times, even as adults, we do the very same thing. We go to our jobs, and uh, maybe it's a day that we're tired, we don't have the energy, and we just try to do the bare minimum. That which would just get us along, that which would just keep us out of trouble with a boss for that particular day, and just try to escape by on all those activities. I know students at least uh, when I was a student, there would be things like, okay, um, what can I do to get by? You know, 
What is the requirements to get by? It really threw me for a loop one uh, day when I was at USI. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, a music appreciation class. Now, why accountants want to take that? It was an elective. And so I go into there, and he says, you contract for the grade that you want to achieve. And I said, all right, man, well, how do I get a C? You know, that, that's where I was at. You know, just how do I get the bare minimum, you know? And, and sometimes all the work that we put forth is what can I do just to get by? I don't want to put any extra effort in. Now, we know as parents, we're looking at our children and thinking we want them to do the absolute best that they possibly can. And there's an attitude that has infiltrated into the church today of what can I just get by with? What can I just, what is the bare minimum that I can get by with? And I'm going to give you some warnings today because the text that we're going to look at in Luke chapter 11, Jesus gives some very dire warnings here. And so you don't understand when we're talking about spiritual things, we're talking about very serious issues. And I want to point out some things in regard to this. I'm going to begin at verse 24. This is Luke chapter 11. And it says this. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and findeth none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of the man is worse than the first and it came to pass as he spake these things a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him blessed is the womb that bare thee and the pap which has sucked. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. We look at this particular passage and we reflect back on the previous things that Jesus Christ has been talking about and teaching up to this very point. We can even go back all the way to verse 13 and begin to understand where Jesus Christ said there is something that is absolutely imperative, important to understand in the Christian life. That your life is to be guided by the Holy Spirit of God. And there is a danger that is spoken of in this particular text where he says you cannot have an empty heart. There is something that we begin to have in our minds and our hearts where Jesus Christ says, I want to shake you a little bit. I want to shock you. I want to even put a little fear inside of you. I want you to see how serious this is in regards to living the spiritual life. This compels us to do a self-examination, to begin to say, where am I in my spiritual life? And God says, I want you to understand that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, there is a deception that needs to be clarified in this. I do not believe and I don't see anywhere in the scriptures that talks about where a Christian can be demon-possessed. As a matter of fact, I believe it in all of my heart that if you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, a demon cannot enter therein. And if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit resides in your heart. But what is it that Jesus Christ is speaking of here when he said there was a demon in a man, the demon leaves and then comes back, finds it all cleaned up, and then he goes out, finds seven other demons worse than he himself, and then they all invade in this very person's life. Now I want you to think about who it is that Jesus Christ is speaking to in this particular chapter. He has been talked about as being a person who is casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. Jesus Christ says Satan doesn't work like that. A house divided is not something that can stand. By the way, Abraham Lincoln made a very famous speech based upon that particular text. 
But we find here Jesus Christ is talking to those who think of themselves as very spiritual individuals. They're criticizing everything that Jesus Christ has done. They cannot see any good in Jesus Christ. Everything that he does or says has to be looked at, tainted, and criticized in some way, shape, or form. And they are pouring forth that very attitude towards Jesus Christ. So he's talking to a very religious crowd. Understand that there are very religious crowds that are demon-possessed. There are very religious crowds that are demon-possessed. Oh, no, they don't, they don't show it. As a matter of fact, we begin to think about demon-possessed individuals like the, the, the Gadarean uh, who was across the Sea of Galilee, who ran around naked and cut himself with stones and, and lived in, 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 in t- around tombstones and graveyards. And we think, oh, that is a demon-possessed man. We have no problem understanding that. We would look at the person ourselves and say, that person's acting like a demon-possessed individual. But Jesus Christ sets aside that and says, I want you to understand, there are some people who are very religious and they are demon-possessed. So I want you to look at five things with me very quickly here. Number one is this, a cleaned life. Look at verse 24 here. There is a situation of an unclean spirit that leaves. This demon has left this man. We're not told why this demon left this man. We are not told the circumstances. We're not told if someone cast out this demon. We're not told whatever the circumstances was, the demon has left this particular man. Now, you and I would be tempted to think, well, this focus is on a demon. It is not. We begin to think in religious terms here, and we think that there is a focus here in regards to this. Jesus Christ is not in concern about this demon. Demons do what demons do. Jesus Christ is concerned about an individual that this demon was in. Jesus emphasizes this person who has cleaned up their life and it looks good this person looks different from the outside others would gather around and say this person looks like a good person most individuals in this world would say if it's a good person that is a good thing most religions in this world says our end goal is to make a person a good person But then we read this text and we begin to be a little confused here because we're, we're wondering, why is Jesus criticizing a person who has cleaned up their life? There's not a mother or father who would look at a son or daughter and if their life got cleaned up, we would rejoice. We say, well, good, they cleaned up their life. We'd be happy about that. You'd be, maybe you've got a, a good friend, uh, and you say, well, my friend cleaned up his or her life, and therefore that's a good thing. And on the surface, we would rejoice in regards of that. But Jesus Christ is saying some things that look good or seem good are not good. And this particular text is pointing that very thing out. We might even ask, when you might ask the preacher today and say, well, preacher, what's wrong with a cleaned up life? What's wrong with an individual like that? Jesus is saying here that a cleaned up life is not a good thing. I hope that shocks you. It should. Jesus intends it to shock us. To think, well, what do you mean? A cleaned up life is not a good thing. We'd say, well, most religions, their end goal is to have a clean life. Even atheists who do not believe in God will say, well, it's a good thing when a person cleans up their life. They're only saying you can clean up your life and you just don't need Jesus Christ to do that very thing. You see, the atheists will say you don't need religion to have a cleaned up life. Many Christians and denominations today, the end goal is to clean up a life. So if someone has done that, then they're a good and moral person. We live in a society today that praises moralism. Let me say to you, the Bible makes it very clear being moral is not enough. Al Mohler wrote an article. The article was entitled, Why Moralism is Not the Gospel. And I'm going to quote from him. He said, quote, Moralism promises the favor of God and the satisfaction of God's righteousness to sinners if they will only behave and commit themselves to moral improvement. 
we sin against Christ and we misrepresent the gospel when we suggest to sinners that what God demands of them is moral improvement in accordance with the law. And that is absolutely true. If you think that you're going to make someone good by saying be moral, do good, do these right kinds of things, and we think, oh, our job is done, then we have failed miserably to be good witnesses of Jesus Christ. Because that is not the whole gospel. Usually our witnessing uh, opportunities go something like this. We, we go to someone and say, well, you know you are a sinner. <clears throat> you have broken God's law, and you're going to pay for your sin in hell unless... You come to Jesus Christ, receive his forgiveness, and clean up your life. And by that very description, there are many individuals who say, okay, I know that I'm a sinner, and if the end goal is just to clean up my life, I'll just skip the stuff about Jesus and start cleaning up my life. How many times have you and I witnessed to individuals and say, come to Jesus Christ, and they say, well, you know, I've been thinking about coming to church, but I'm going to clean up my life, and I'll get right with God. That is a problem in people's minds. It is a huge problem. It is, it is a stumbling block and why many individuals do not come to Christ because they're thinking, well, to come to Christ, i got to be good and i got to clean up my life. Then I can come to Christ. And Jesus Christ is describing that very kind of thinking in this particular text. And he says that kind of thinking will lead you straight to hell. Yes, a person can clean up their life. But if they don't understand their desperate desperate need of Jesus Christ living in their life they are just as a demon possessed individual moralism has never worked moralism has never worked y'all heard of things that have never worked but someone else comes along and says you know what I'm going to try that thing that's never ever worked ever in all of history but I'll get it right you know there's people still trying to do that kind of thing today right Moralism has never worked, and Jesus Christ declares it will never work because your life will fail in cleaning itself up. What a clean life does simply is to invite more demons into it. Now, let me further explain by going to point number two, the empty life. Here is the danger. An empty life is simply a cleaned up life that makes it look good on the outside, but it's not real on the inside. Do you know the number of people who are, are just within a mile or two of this church who are thinking, I just have one bad habit. If I can just overcome this one bad habit, then I'll be a good person. There are multitudes of individuals who say, you know, if I can just get rid of my, my drinking problem, then I'll be a good person. There are others saying, if I can just get rid of my drug problem, then I'll be a good person. Someone else is saying, if I can just get rid of my lust, then I'll be a good person. Someone else is saying, if I can just get rid of my filthy mouth, I can be a good person. Another is saying, if I can just get rid of my lazy life and quit watching TV, then I'll be a good person. And the Bible is often described a list of do's and don'ts. And if you can just get those do's and don'ts down right, then you'll be a good person. And Jesus Christ is explaining something very here, very real here, and that is you can't clean up your life. We have a very nature to sin. We're born with a nature to sin. You need a radical change in the very nature of your being. I've often heard, heard individuals describe, if I can just stop this one thing, then everything will be all right, and their life is just empty. And there's a frustration that they, they see, it's just like my life just keeps oozing sin, and I cannot stop this sin in my life. You cannot maintain a void. Jesus says, the demons left, the house was clean, and it was empty. You cannot maintain in emptiness. I was talking to my Sunday or day, he told me something I hadn't heard before, <clears throat> that about 67% of all the work done on the International Space Station is done repairing something that's broken. Now, that thing's about 20 years old now, and it's falling apart, and so about two-thirds of all the work done on the station is trying to fix something that's falling apart. As a matter of fact, there was one of those capsules that sprung a leak. It was a slow leak, and they couldn't find where it was leaking. 
And they knew it was in that particular capsule. They had cut off all the rest of it, and they knew that capsule kept losing pressure, and they were trying to find out where this leak was. And so one of the, uh, <clears throat> the astronauts got into that capsule, closed it off, and took a tea leaf and sit there and let it hang in the zero G until that leaf finally went over to the leak and stuck in the hole. And he found out where the leak was. That's how they're fixing the International Space Station, folks. Uh, that doesn't really bode a lot of confidence. How many of y'all want to go to moon next, you know? Uh, you know, not, not on that one, not me, uh-uh. But this is where we begin to understand there's something in our lives, and we leak, folks. Morality leaks. It cannot stay a maintained status, and Jesus Christ is saying you cannot do that. Morality leaks. The third thing I want you to see is this. There is a worse state. There is a worse state. Now, I know this is hard to grasp sometimes, but it's absolutely true. Jesus Christ cuts across this. Let me describe to you two people. The first person is uh, a drunk. He has ruined his family. He is living on the streets because he's lost about everything. Now, let me describe another person to you. <clears throat> he's a good man. He works hard. He takes care of his family. And from the outside, everybody says, that's a good individual. My question to you is which of those two individuals would Jesus Christ say is in the worst state? Which of those two individuals is in the worst state? Now, most individuals would quickly say, you know, the good man taking care of his family, working hard, that's, that's the better state. That's the better condition of the individual. Let's go back to what I just read to you. This man cleaned up his life. And seven demons came into it. Jesus Christ has just described the good moral man is in a worse state than the one who is on the street and a drunkard. You say, now preacher, I'm having a hard trouble handling that because our human logic just doesn't seem to go there. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking long like most individuals. Well, someone who's got a good, cleaned up life, aren't they closer to being saved? Are, are, is not a person who, who's living a godly life but yet does not know Jesus Christ, aren't they on the way to salvation? Aren't they closer to being saved than the person who is a drunk living in the street? And Jesus Christ would say to you and I, no. Jesus Christ would say the drunk is closer to being saved. Now, about this time, somebody who's a good Bible student will say, Preacher, give me evidence of that in the Bible. I'm glad you asked. Because Jesus Christ stared at these individuals he's talking to. These individuals he's talking to and said these words. Drunks, prostitutes, and tax collectors will go into heaven before you. You see, Jesus Christ is making the point here. It's not about a cleaned up life. Jesus Christ is the one who says in the book of Revelation, I'd rather you be hot or I'd rather you be cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. That is the words of Jesus Christ. That is the emphasis of what he is saying here in these very verses. The one who is in a mess of their life knows they need someone to come and clean them up. The one who cleans up their own life says, look what I have achieved. I'm a good person. I should be acceptable to God now. Jesus Christ cuts across all of that and says, no, this person needs to recognize they are a sinner in need of a Savior that can transform their life. Point number four is this, falling short. Falling short is rather a, a relative term. <clears throat> I mean, we can fall short in a lot of ways. One of the illustrations that is often used in witnessing to individuals, and it's a good illustration, it's good, use this one, use this one. Let's say that the goal is heaven, and let's say it doesn't, by the way, but let's say heaven resides in, in Hawaii, <clears throat> okay? It doesn't, but let's just pretend it does. And so we line up on the California coast, every human being, and say the goal is swim to Hawaii, now, we know there are some of you who'd get out there probably several miles, and I'd be impressed. 
You know, to me, I'll get knee deep in water and just pass out and die. You know, I mean, I, you know, my swimming abilities are pretty much nil. You know, I'm not getting past, you know, the first sand dune. Well, you know, it's just not going to happen, right? I mean, I'm just not going to be there. But some people can swim way out past me. But how does that compare to anybody swimming to Hawaii? Do you know how Hawaii is a long ways away? And if you want to put percentages down here, the percentage of, the, of the, the Olympic athlete swimmer as he goes out in the ocean isn't even going to be 1% of the way. Let's use another illustration. Let's try to jump to the moon. You know, let's try to, you know, everybody's going to get up and we're just going to jump to the moon. Now, I might be able to get six inches under my feet, you know. Uh, you know, it's getting less and less every meal I eat. But nonetheless, you know, there'll be some, I mean, you've seen some of these, these uh, Olympic athletes, you know, run and jump 20 some odd feet. It's amazing. Big, big tall, long-legged, I mean, they can probably jump higher than my height. But what does that matter if you're saying, let's jump to the moon? The moon is a quarter of a million miles away. A quarter of a million miles away, the best jumper isn't even going to make 1% on that comparison. You see, everything is going to fall short. And Jesus Christ is saying to us, we clean up our lives. That is just not acceptable to God. Now, I know <clears throat> there's some of you who like clean houses. Uh, I have known people that vacuum their carpet every day. What is up with that? <laughs> I, know, I know of someone who when they vacuum, they want the vacuum streaks to line up a certain way and to look that neat. You're just messed up. You know, I don't know what's wrong with you. And some of you are such clean freaks that if you saw a little cobweb waving, you'd probably just pass out. That'd be it, you know. And some of you, if you were to look in your window seal and see a dead fly or a spider, you'd think, oh, the house is disastrous. Yeah, come to my house for a while. You'll get over that real quick. I got at least 50 ladybugs on my ceiling right now. Right now, just at least, you know. We think about cleanliness. And Jesus Christ is talking about a clean house here. He's using that as a metaphor for a person's life, a person who cleans up their life. By the way, I love the proverb. There's a proverb that says spiders are in king's houses. I love that proverb. You know, that's one you need to memorize for you folks who want to clean every day, you know. But, but we think about clean life. We cannot be good enough for God. It is only God who can make us good enough for himself. Now listen to me. That is not intended to exasperate us. That, that's not intended to depress us or, or to frustrate us in some way. It's not intended to lead us to despair. As a matter of fact, Paul will write in, in Romans that it, he describes that that uh, the law of God is meant to be a schoolmaster that drives us to Jesus Christ because he's the only one that has the righteousness acceptable to God. And that's why he died on the cross for our sins. It is through faith in what Jesus has accomplished. All my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags before Almighty God. So as much as one might try to clean up their house, it is never good enough. It should drive us to Jesus Christ saying, it's not about me cleaning up a life because all that does is invite more demons into one's life. But yet where we have received Jesus Christ, demons cannot reside. The fifth point is this. Hear and observe the Word of God. That's what Jesus Christ says. There's, a, there's someone from the audience in verse 27 that calls out, Blessed is your mother. He's talking about the mother. Oh, how blessed your mother is. And, and Jesus Christ deals with this several times. Remember, uh, matter of fact, his two 
uh, brothers. Mary has other children, and, and so uh, these other half-brothers come to Jesus with Mary, and, and they say, we've got to get Jesus home. He's gone crazy, and, and, and someone comes into Jesus and says, your mother and your brothers are all outside. And Jesus says, let me tell you who my mother and brothers are, those who obey the Word of God. And this is what he concludes in verse 29 here, or 28, the very same thing. The real blessing is the one who hears the Word of God and keeps it. Now, if you just listen to that one verse alone, you're going to be not putting it into the context of all that Jesus Christ has said here. We can go back and say, well, then just clean up your life. Well, that's what he just criticized in verses 24, 25, and 26. It's not about cleaning up your life. That just invites more demons that are worse into your life. No, the reality here is that the only way you and I can ever actually hear the Word of God and actually obey the Word of God is through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. He must be the one that lives through us. He is the one that we submit our lives to. He is the one that fills our life and we obey what God has spoken in His Word and we hear it. You wonder why some individuals who, who listen to the Word of God and it just, it just makes no sense to them, they could care less about it, it rolls past them, it's like water off a duck's back, they just move on and say, who cares? And then someone else, maybe even sitting right beside them, can hear the Word of God and they fall under conviction and they say, oh God, I'm sorry, I have sinned against you. And they're broken. And they cry out to God. What is the difference between that? is the difference of the Holy Spirit working in someone's life. So Christian, I ask you, is the Holy Spirit working in your life? Because if you have the Holy Spirit, then you hear the Word of God, you obey it, and it is God who cleans up your life. If you're sitting here today, say, well, you know, I can clean up my own life. I can be good enough to be acceptable to God. Then all you've done is cleaned up a demon-possessed life that's still demon-possessed. There is a massive difference between conviction and and obligation. Let me explain that. <clears throat> obligation is something that is an outward impression on our lives. We feel compelled to do something because of outward obligation. Parents, when they're raising children, the child is small and does not know right from wrong. And so the parent has to bring an obligation to that child. And there might be some kind of consequences of their actions. When they do wrong, parent has to administer some kind of consequences to help that child know that is wrong. I can't do that anymore. And that begins to, begin, begins to be an obligation in that person's life. The hope and the desire is that when that parent is no longer there, that obligation has changed to a conviction. There are many trying to live a Christian life under obligation. They have come and they've done all the outward actions that uh, others would say, well, they're a Christian. Maybe they come down during an invitation time and say, I want to be saved. Maybe they prayed a prayer. Maybe they got baptized in a baptistry. Maybe their name's on a church roll and they're saying, I've done all that I need to do to be a Christian to outward man. And that person can be a cleaned up life full of demons. But then there is the understanding of a conviction. A conviction is something that's in our hearts. Conviction closely relates to your conscience. It is the conscience that the Holy Spirit works. It is the conscience that says, I'm going to live in your heart, in your thoughts, in your mind. And when you sin, I'm going to bring conviction on your life because of that sin. It's not an outward kind of influence, it's an inward kind of influence. And when a person truly becomes a Christian, they have the Holy Spirit in them telling them that conviction. I've had questions asked me. I just spent some time in Dave Russell's Sunday school class and, and had a lot of questions asked me. I've had a lot of people asking me questions about what I should do, what I should not do. I had a lot of questions in regards to why I do what I do. And I've often tried to explain to individuals, if you do something because the preacher tells you to do it, it is not going to last in your life. There's a lot of people who went through the motions of whatever their church told them to do to be a part of the church or be a Christian, and they just did it because the preacher told them to do it. 
Maybe they prayed a prayer because the preacher told them to do it. Maybe they got baptized because the preacher told them to do it. Maybe their name's on church roll because the preacher told them to do that. And they did it because a preacher told them to do that. And then maybe that preacher died. And the influence of that preacher is no longer there. And I simply ask the question, then you'll understand when it's an obligation because of someone else in your life or it's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction in your own heart. You see, Jesus Christ speaks here that we are blessed when we hear the Word of God and we obey it. And that is a sign and understanding that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. There are multitudes of individuals who go to church and they're fighting evil in their life continually because they're not relying on what God said. Trust in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will guide you in your life. The Holy Spirit guides us through our conscience, through convictions in our heart. And guess what, folks? That will never leave you. Even when you're alone at night and you lay your head on a pillow at night, your conviction is right there with you, guiding you in your life. That is the Holy Spirit. That is the difference of a life that truly has been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are multitudes who have been a self-satisfied, I'm a good person, and Jesus Christ would describe that they have seven more demons in their life because they're based their salvation on being good. And Jesus Christ says that is an absolute failure. We must have the understanding the Holy Spirit changes our hearts from the inside out. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. I I want you to think personally with this this morning. I I want you to spend some time in saying, Lord, I I want to understand your spirit working inside of me right now. There might be some here today that's saying, you know, I've just tried to base my goodness on being good on the outside and just cleaning up my life, thinking that, well, surely God's got to accept me because I'm a good person. I've joined a church. I've, I, I've been through religious ritual. Therefore, God has to accept to me. But you know there's something inside of you that's not driving you by the Holy Spirit of God. Then maybe you need to ask that question today. Let me examine myself to see if I am in the faith. Today, you may say, oh, I know I have trusted Christ alone for my salvation. I cannot save myself. I cannot be good enough. Therefore, I trust God alone. Then let us make sure we speak the gospel clearly to individuals. It's not about cleaning up your life. It's about trusting Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross for you. Maybe today you say, I want to talk to somebody a little bit further about what it means to be saved. It would be our great delight to do that. Might it be that God is speaking to your heart in some other area that you might say, you know, I know it is by faith alone and Christ alone for my salvation. And I want to live that out by the conviction of the Holy Spirit in me Then make that commitment to the Lord right now. Maybe God is working your heart in some other way, whatever it is, you do what God wants you to do right now. Let's lift our heads. Let's stand and sing as God leads. You come.